the 2025 AHA guidelines for CPR and ECC. Yeah, it's a lot. And let's be honest, as healthcare providers, finding time to read, what, 300 pages of updates? It's tough. Exactly. And these aren't just small tweaks. They really lay out the uh, evolving roadmap for resuscitation. Evidence-based, of course. And there are some pretty big shifts you'll need to integrate, like, right away. Okay, let's start with the why, the numbers. What statistics really jump out and show the urgency behind these new guidelines? Well, the urgency really comes from the survival rates. They're still tragically low in many cases. Cardiac arrest is uh, it's still a major public health crisis. And that gap you mentioned between different settings. Oh, it's huge. The difference between in-hospital and out-of-hospital outcomes is significant. Okay, give us the hard data. Where are we doing okay? And maybe more importantly, where are things lagging? All right. So first, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, OHCA, the incidence. It's about 378.7 individuals per 100,000 people here in the U.S. 378.7 per 100,000. And the survival for those adults? Uh, adult OHCA survival to discharge. It's only 10.5%. 10.5. That's Well, that stayed stubbornly low, hasn't it? It really has. And it just highlights how much we need better intervention before patients even reach the hospital. And compared to inside the hospital, what are those IHCA numbers? So in hospital cardiac arrest, IHCA, we estimate around 292,000 cases every year. Okay. And the adult IHCA survival to discharge rate is, well, it's better. It stands at 23.6%. 23.6. So better, yes, but still a lot of room for improvement even in that structured environment. And connecting back to that, um, that really tough OHCA number, the 10.5%. Community involvement plays a massive role there, doesn't it? Absolutely. We're missing huge opportunities. The rate of bystander CPR for adults in OHCA, it's only 41.7%. Just over 40%. Right. Getting that number up is probably the single biggest thing we can do to move that 10.5% needle. Hmm. Okay, so the adult data is pretty sobering. But you mentioned one area showing real improvement, pediatric care. Yes, this is actually a fantastic success story. It shows what happens when systems really focus. Pediatric and hospital cardiac arrest survival has nearly doubled. Doubled? Really? Yeah. It went from 18.9% back in 2000 up to 45.2% reported in 2023. Wow. 189 up to 452 That's incredible. It is. It proves that, you know, focused, evidence-based training and making sure the system works together, it makes a dramatic difference in outcomes. <sighs> that pediatric success really underlines the need for a clear blueprint. The AHA always uses these foundational frameworks. How have they simplified things this time around? The core actions for survival. Yeah, they really focused on consolidation, making it consistent. We used to have, what, four different chains of survival, adult, pediatric, in hospital, out of hospital. Right, it got a bit complicated. Exactly, so now those are all merged. It's a single universal six link chain of survival. One chain for everyone. One universal chain makes training and response much more straightforward for, well, for everyone involved. Okay, consolidate four into one six link chain. <laughs> Simple enough. Mm -hmm. But did they introduce any totally new frameworks? for specific groups? Yes, they did. And this is a pretty major conceptual shift. There's a brand new, very specific framework, the seven link newborn chain of care. A seven link chain just for newborns. What makes that one different from the universal chain? The key difference is when it starts. It actually begins before the birth. Before birth, how so? It puts emphasis on things like uh, optimal parental health, making sure there's good prenatal care and focusing on safe practices during delivery, intrapartum practices. Ah, okay. So it's acknowledging that preparation for newborn survival starts way earlier. Precisely. Long before that first breath. Got it. Now, beyond the immediate chains, there's always this bigger picture plan, uh, the Udstein formula for survival. How does that fit into the 2025 guidelines? The Udstein formula. Think of it as the strategic overview. It explains why survival rates change or why they don't. It highlights three factors that all have to work together. Okay, what are they? First, guideline quality, that's the science itself. Is it sound? Usually, yes. Second, education, can people actually do what the guidelines recommend? And third, local implementation, is there a system in place that actually makes it all happen smoothly? So if we look back at that 10.5% OHCA survival rate, the Oosting formula suggests the problem probably isn't the science, the guideline quality. Exactly right. The science is generally solid. The weak points are almost always in, you know, the education piece, maybe skills decay or failures in the local implementation. Things like systems not coordinating well, especially across different areas or populations. Okay, moving from the plan to actually doing it. 
Clear communication is absolutely vital in an emergency. What key terminology changes do we as HCPs need to adopt immediately? Standardization was a really big theme here. Trying to reduce confusion, that cognitive load between, say, 911 dispatchers, lay rescuers, and advanced providers. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So what's the new term for someone who isn't a professional rescuer? Bystander. Layperson. We're moving away from those. The preferred term now, the one you should use in charting and training, is lay rescuer. Lay rescuer. Okay. Why the change? It reinforces their active role. They aren't just standing by. They're part of the rescue, a critical part of that chain. Got it. Lay rescuer. Now, breathing. Assisted breathing. That's always been a bit confusing, depending on who's doing what. How did they simplify that? They drew a much clearer line. For a lay rescuer who is helping someone with a pulse... We used to say rescue breaths. Now it's just breaths. Breaths, breaths. Simpler. Much simpler. And for professionals using devices, like a bag mask. That is now strictly called ventilations. That term is only for healthcare professionals using a mechanical device. Okay, so a clear distinction. Breaths for the lay level, usually mouth to mouth, versus ventilations for the HCP level using a device. Exactly. Breaths versus ventilations. There's also an update about documenting circulation, especially when using advanced machines like ECMO. Clarify ROSC versus ROC for us. Yes, this is clinically really important for documentation. We now need to specifically differentiate ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. That means the patient's own heart has started beating effectively again. Okay, spontaneous means the heart's doing it on its own. Right. And the newer term, ROC, return of circulation, is used when blood flow is happening only because of mechanical support like ECMO. Ah, uh, okay. ROC means the machine is doing the work. Correct. Documenting ROC clarifies that the patient is still machine dependent for perfusion. It avoids the very serious error of thinking they have autonomous heart function when they don't, vital for post-arrest care decisions. Now, a really compelling theme in these 2025 guidelines is health equity. What data specifically push the AHA to make tackling these inequities such a central focus? The data is, frankly, impossible to ignore. It's a clear mandate for change. Survival outcomes just aren't equal for everyone. In what ways? Well, data consistently shows that racial and ethnic minority groups experience worse neurological recovery after cardiac arrest. And it's not just demographics, it's geography too, right? Oh, absolutely staggering differences. People in rural areas. Their outcomes for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are roughly 50% lower than in metropolitan areas. 50% lower, just based on location. 50%. When where you live cuts your chance of survival in half. The system is clearly failing in those places. So how do the guidelines suggest systems start measuring and fixing this? Are there new metrics involved? Yes, they're establishing what they call the ECC 2030 impact goals. The aim is to really push for equitable access to survival and care. It means system leaders need to actively look at their outcomes based on zip code, demographics, socioeconomic factors. So stop looking at just the overall average survival. Exactly. Start identifying the specific communities or neighborhoods where survival lags behind and then target resources and interventions directly to fix those disparities. Okay. Shifting focus to preventing arrests inside the hospital IHCA prevention. What system recommendations are now being pushed together for hospitals? Prevention is key. The guidelines are recommending a more unified approach now. That means implementing strong adult and pediatric early warning systems. Okay. Making sure rapid response teams are used effectively and seamlessly. Right. And also incorporating regular safety huddles for patients identified as high risk. Safety huddles. We hear about those in surgery, like with checklists. How do they prevent a medical cardiac arrest? It's about being proactive. It means the team nurses, doctors, maybe respiratory therapists, quickly get together to review a high-risk patient, maybe someone whose vital signs are worsening or who's had multiple rapid response calls. And the goal. To identify reversible causes early and intervene before they deteriorate into a full arrest, catch it upstream. Makes sense. What about the resuscitation team itself during an IHCA? Any major updates to operational standards? Yes, it's about capability during the event. The new guidance supports having a defined team structure, and it emphasizes, really mandates the presence of at least one ACLS trained member during every single IHCA. So someone certified in advanced cardiovascular life support must be there. Must be present. It elevates the minimum standard for competency right there at the bedside during the CLERD. And post-arrest care is always evolving. What's the latest direction regarding quality improvement after an event? It's about learning from every event. 
the guidelines are strongly advocating for both immediate, what they call hot debriefing. Right after the code? Yeah, right after the event right. while it's fresh. And also delayed or cold debriefing, which might happen hours or days later, maybe with more data. Hot and cold debriefing. Exactly. This structured process, talking about what went well, what could be improved, is seen as essential for driving continuous improvement in this system. Okay, one last big area. Transport for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. The 2020 guidelines really pushed sending patients to specialized cardiac arrest centers. Has that changed? This is a bit of a nuanced update. The new guidance still supports good on-scene resuscitation and early transport for most patients. However, that specific recommendation about transporting directly to a regionalized cardiac arrest center, its class of recommendation has been reduced. It's down from class 2A to class 2B. Wait, down to 2B? That sounds like they're less strongly recommending those specialized centers now. Why the change? It's not really a step back from wanting quality care. It's more a reflection that our ability to stabilize patients on scene has improved. Things like temperature management, hemodynamic support. The science and protocols for pre-hospital care are better. Ah, so if you can achieve good stabilization in the field. Exactly. If the initial resuscitation on scene is highly effective, then the absolute necessity of immediate transport only to the highest level designated center becomes slightly less critical compared to when initial stabilization was maybe weaker. It gives systems a bit more flexibility based on their local resources, transport times, and the patient's initial response. Okay, let's try to boil this down. Three essential mandatory changes for you, the listener, to implement starting now. First, first, get rid of the old frameworks in your head. Adopt the single universal six link chain of survival. And if you work in OB or PEDS, integrate that new seven link newborn chain of care. Second, terminology. Right. You have to start using the new standard terms immediately. It's lay rescuer, not bystander. Differentiate clearly between breaths, lay rescuer, simple airway, and ventilations, HCP device. And clinically, get that ROSC versus ROC documentation right. Okay. And third, Systems need to change. Yes. Healthcare systems absolutely must audit their data for those equity gaps and then act on them. And hospital systems need to mandate those combined prevention strategies, early warning systems, RRTs, and definitely safety huddles, plus ensure there's always at least one ACLS trained member at every IHCA. So the big takeaway here is that survival isn't random luck. Not at all. The guidelines really hammer this home. Survival is the product of a system, a deliberate, unified system working effectively. And maybe a final thought for everyone listening. Connecting back to that equity theme, those disparities we talked about, the 50% rural survival gap, the neurological outcome differences, it forces a question for every single one of us. What specific part of your local system, your training, your protocols, your data tracking, what piece can you identify and start improving today to help close those equity gaps highlighted in these new guidelines?